The Last Survivors, Echoes from the Holocaust. The Survivor Mitzvah Project presents the inspiring and compelling story of the last survivors still living in Eastern Europe and the heroic effort to bring emergency aid to these forgotten heroes. Starring Edward Asner, Francis Fisher, Elliot Gould, Valerie Harper, Lainey Kazan, Alan Rosenberg. Special appearance by Consul General of Israel, David Siegel. With musical guests, Randall Keith and Arnold McCullough. And Survivor Mitzvah founder and CNN hero, Zane Busby. Thank you so much. You know, tonight, the Survivor Mitzvah Project celebrates you. You who have taken time from the busy world we all inhabit to be kind, to be compassionate, to care, to act on your convictions and help these Holocaust survivors keep surviving. There are people scattered all across Eastern Europe, alone and lonely, still struggling and struggling to survive. These are the people that you are helping. These are the people that you are rescuing. The Holocaust is steeped in death. But tonight, the Survivor Mitzvah Project celebrates life. <laughs> I'm a television director by trade, and during a break from shooting, I thought it would be a wonderful idea if I went to seek out my roots and find the birthplaces of my grandparents in Eastern Europe. I was so excited about doing this that I told my whole crew about it, and they were really excited to go with me until I told them where I was going, the town of Vishnava, but I told them Lithuania because I thought it would be an easier sell, but it wasn't. So they said, you go, we're going to Maui. So I said, aloha to my crew, and I went off alone to these unsunny lands in Eastern Europe. After poking around Lithuania for just a couple of days, I hired a driver to take me across the border into Belarus. Now, as soon as we got there and crossed that border, the car broke down. So fortunately, my guide and I were able to hitch a ride, and unfortunately, it was in a horse-drawn hay cart. <laughs> so I'm in this hay cart, and the driver keeps turning around and staring at me, and he goes, Amerikanski. And I went, da. And he goes, uh, hot dog. <laughs> and I said, da. And he says, Billy Crystal. <laughs> so here I am in a hay cart with a driver who's a Billy Crystal fan. <laughs> Go figure. But as we made our way through these back roads, it was like going back in time, really 100 years or so. There were no cars, no shops crooked little houses with broken fences. Synagogues, old wooden ones, beautiful but barely standing, empty and forgotten, and the ghosts of millions. The first thing that struck me was how close the war seemed. Buildings were in great disrepair, they were abandoned. There were bullet holes visible on all the facades. It was a haunting ruin of a landscape. And it made the period of the Holocaust seem so close because I was walking down those same crooked streets. I was passing those same rivers. I was crossing those same swamps. I was going by those same forests where thousands hid and thousands were murdered. So I went to find the town of Vishnava, the town of my ancestors. And this is kind of like what it looked like, the countryside. And I thought that was the house of my grandfather, but it wasn't because it was long gone. And then I thought that one was, but it wasn't because it was long gone. And oh, oh, that, that's our driver <laughs> saying goodbye. And this is the main street in the town. And these are my cousins. <laughs> Apparently, there was a lot of intermarriage in this place. <laughs> Now, I had a short list of eight names in my pocket, names that were given to me by a professor in Lithuania, Professor David Katz, and he said, please, please, go visit them. These were survivors. He called them the last of the Mohicans. These were people who were living in remote areas and villages, people who could use a little food, who could use a visit, who could use a helping hand, who could use some money. And he said, just go and visit them. And I thought, visit them? 
how am I gonna communicate with these people? I mean, how would I explain who I was and how I knew him and how I knew them and how I got their address? It was all too confusing. I only speak English and show business Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, words like schlep and schmooze. <laughs> and he said, just say shalom aleichem. So on the back road searching for my roots, I visited these people in their huts, total strangers, and I would knock on their doors and no one was ever home because they were all out back. People in their 80s and 90s, they were out back on their hands and knees digging up their potatoes because if they didn't, the ground would freeze and they wouldn't have a winter food supply. Now, I must say, my presence scared the hell out of them <laughs> because these are people who have not had a very good history with strangers knocking on their door. And then I remembered, all right, say shalom aleichem. So I said, shalom aleichem. And they would turn around immediately, a beautiful big smile, and they'd come over and hug me. And an immediate connection had been made, a connection that spanned thousands of years. They invited me into the huts, and I listened to their stories. Now, who were these people? Some were sole survivors of their families. Some were brave partisans who fought in the forests of Lithuania and Belarus. Some ran from the killing fields as their parents and families were massacred. Some survived brutal evacuations to the east where their trains were bombarded by German airstrikes. All of them ran from the Einsatzgruppen, the German mobile killing squads who roared into towns and villages on motorcycles, killing every man, woman, and child in their path in the most brutal ways, and then torching these villages and moving on to the next one, the next massacre. And some were slaves in the gulag years after the war ended. All were elderly and alone and in dire need. In every case, the German killing machine had decimated their lives. Seventy years after the start of the war, these people were still suffering. They lacked the means to buy even the most basic of human necessities. These were people who had fallen through the cracks, who received no money from Germany, no money from reparations, no money from any other organization, people who had absolutely no lifeline. Well, I returned home to the world of comedy, and I couldn't get these people out of my head. Who would care for them? What would they do? How could they face the incredible challenges of old age and illness with this harsh winter about to approach? I was just compelled to do something, but I didn't know what could I possibly do from here. And I was busy, and I was working, but I, I just was compelled, and I thought, you know, I can send them money, that's what I can do. And so that's what I did. So what I did was I would take pieces of paper and on it draw a big heart and put a star in the center of it, wrap up some bills and send it off. Because I didn't know the language, I didn't know how to communicate with them. And I figured, you know, even if they didn't know who it was from, they would know someone was out there, someone cared. Then one day, an amazing thing happened. I got letters back. They started coming in all on little tiny scraps of torn notebook paper. And they were in Russian, and I couldn't read them. So I would keep them in my car, and on the way to the studio, every time I saw a refrigerator repair truck, <laughs> I would cut it off. I would jump out. I'd run over to the driver. I'd hold up the letter. I'd say, you're Russian, right? Right? Read this to me. Everyone knows every refrigerator repairman in LA is a Russian rocket scientist. So I slowly, I began to read what these people were saying to me, and it, it was incredible. My name is Rahil Gershevna from Grodno, Belarus. I was born in 1911. I am very, very old. I received your letter and the money. I was so surprised. I couldn't sleep all night. I can't believe there are such nice people in the world. I received some money from the government, but only enough for bread and milk. I can't believe that someone in America would want to help me. Thank you so much. Now I am not alone. We are all sick here, and I really don't know how to live further. I am sorry for this letter. My writing is so bad, and I am very old. My mother and father were killed in Babi Yar. It is so difficult life. I sometimes think it would have been better if I had died with them. I am grateful to you over and over for your help, which for me means faith that there will be another day. When I was opening the envelope, my hands shook with emotion. Right now, when I write these lines, there is a lump in my throat from tears. 
I am sitting and crying that total strangers are taking care of me. Thank you for the help that is not only material, but also moral, showing us that in our quite cruel world, there exists philanthropy, sympathy, and other warm human feelings. I lost my wife, so I know how sad and lonely it is to be alone how important it is to have a faithful friend. From your heart, you sent good wishes to me. For this, I will remember you till my last day. I am touched by your attention, grateful for the help and the spiritual warmth. Indeed, not everyone would want to help strangers. Life is hard. Heat is from wood-burning stove that needs firewood chopped, and I am so weak. But what can I do? Write. I am very interested in how you live. Best wishes from a world far away. I am Misha, writing for my mother. She is blind. I write from her words. She has endured difficulties that are not to be described in a letter. But now, she is surrounded by the warmth of people like you who care about her fate. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You so open-handedly make people's lives better. Your generosity is worth all the diamonds in the world. We do not know what we would do at the present time without your help. This help is beyond my dreams. I am the only one who survived from a very big family. It's so hard to be alone at this age. If only you knew how important your help and your love is for me. What I feel from you. I can't walk, haven't been out in years. I am so ill, it's hard to write, forgive me. Be happy, be strong, be healthy. Go on creating noble deeds. Hugs and kisses, Reva. As a child, I ran from the killing squads three times. Even now, I still dream that I am running. Thank you for helping people who need sympathy, for responding to someone's pain and suffering. Life becomes warmer and more cheerful with your kindness and decency. It's impossible to imagine the unbearable situation of old, unhappy people forgotten by everybody. Yours are noble actions. We wish you bright days. It is difficult to live now only one thought dominates, that it does not get worse. But a person lives through hope, and I hope it will get better. We are sisters. We cried when we received the money and appreciation and the love. Thank God he gives to the world people like you who care about us. We kiss all of you who are helping us. I am 96. Thank God I have lived to see this bright day. In my situation, desolate and lonely, old and in poor health, not having a single good friend with whom to speak intimately and unburden my broken heart, you brought me joy. Your faraway friend, Dora. Letters, each letter signed with a heart in closing a star. My signal to them, and now their signal back to me that they understood and were now sending good wishes and love my way. These are the people that I call the unluckiest generation. The oldest of them, born in 1911, experienced the Russian Revolution and World War I as children. Civil war, evacuations, widespread violence. If they survived that, came the pogroms of the 1920s and the enforced famines of the 1930s, where thousands were murdered and thousands perished. If they survived that came the rise of Nazism, then the full-blown Holocaust, with Eastern Europe suffering the greatest losses of all the other countries combined. Families killed, evacuations, homes destroyed, starvation, forced labor, ghettos, slave labor, more destruction. If they survived that after the war, they were caught behind the Iron Curtain, where it was a crime to be Jewish. Again, a crime to own a Jewish book. Again, a crime to speak their own language. If they survived that, came Stalin's purges of the 1950s, 
where thousands were sent to the gulag for 10 more years. Then Chernobyl, radiation, cancers, deaths by the thousands, upheaval and relocation for these very same people. And then perestroika, which we thought was wonderful, but for them it meant the infrastructure of that country has collapsed and every penny saved was taken from them. They went to sleep one night and they woke up the next morning and the banks had seized everything, leaving them penniless and without hope. Every decade a litany of heartbreak. letters. They just kept coming. As Professor Katz in Lithuania found more and more survivors in need, I just stepped up my efforts to help. I continued sending envelopes, but the list continued to grow at the exact same time from eight people to 80 to 100 to 200. I sent more letters. I kept reaching out to friends and family. Would you take these two people? Would you take these three? And expeditions and searches in Eastern Europe continued, and we kept turning up more survivors now in Ukraine and in Moldova and in Slovakia. The list continued to grow, now to 500, and then 800, and then 1,000. People living alone in terrible conditions. The project grew so fast that it became impossible to help everybody. And then angels appeared. Chick Wolk, who is as kind as he is generous, and with his generosity, we joined forces, and we grew the organization to help more and more people. And then another angel appeared, Deborah Barkat. She was so moved by reading the letters that she went home, ripped out her linen closet, installed <laughs> an industrial-sized printer, and started printing our book of letters. And she introduced us to another angel, her sister, Sonia Kovitz, a person with a doctorate in Slavic languages. Finally, a translator. Finally, I could communicate with these people. <laughs> Now Sonia and I were able to write letters and ask them questions. If it isn't too painful, if it isn't too hard, if you really, if you wouldn't mind, what happened to you during the Holocaust? What happened did your, to your family? How did you survive? What were your dreams and hopes before the war? What was it like the day the war started? Tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us everything. It was as if the floodgates opened. We started getting five-page, 10-page, 15-page letters where they poured out their hearts and told us their stories in the most vivid way. And for the most part, they had never told this to anyone before. There was no one to tell it to, or no one had asked ever, or they were too afraid, or it was just too painful and they didn't want to relive it. It was just too horrible, or no one wanted to listen. But suddenly they stood before us and their words jumped off the page and each story began to unfold. Each one of them had all the elements of a feature film. Love, friendship, betrayal, redemption. And from these letters and hundreds and hundreds more, the scope of this tragedy began to unfold in ways I had never imagined. Hearing from you tells me that in distant America, someone remembers me 
a person practically from another dimension. Running from the enemy, we left behind our comfortable dwellings, left our photos and all our belongings. And uh, about this sorrow, nobody ever speaks. We left behind our old people who met all pleased with refusal since who would touch us, old people? But of course they did touch them. They burned them alive. So, parents grabbed their children and fled. Our lives were spared, but our roots were destroyed. Nothing was left of the Jewish community. Not a memory, no language, no holidays, no schools, no synagogues, and above all, no old people. The roots who could raise the young ones like Mother Earth feeds offshoots and leaves. But these shoots and leaves now had to begin from nothing. And this nothing did not remember its God because it didn't even know its own language. It didn't know how to pray. And there was no one to teach, no one to guide, nothing. That is why our correspondence is so dear to me personally. My dear American friends, you are my roots. I save all the letters that I have received from you and I often reread them. You see, from my past, I have only one thing, just one photograph. My grandfather and grandmother on my father's side. This is all that remains for me of my life from before the war, although I don't know a thing about them, who they were, where they lived, what they did, how they laughed, and about what and whom they cried over. Well, I will bring this conversation with you to a close. I don't write, I simply speak with you about whatever comes into my head. Be happy, my dear ones. Maria. And the list just continued to grow, and more and more letters came about the war, during the war, and one woman wrote, Yevgenia Satinovskaya, who lived to be 96 years old, she wrote about the love of her life. She told us how she fell in love with a boy from her village. And they used to lie in the fields at harvest time and dream about their life together. And then the war came, and the Einsatzgruppen came, and almost everyone in the village was massacred, but they took her and her boyfriend, and they brought them to the ghetto for forced labor. And one day they heard that the next day, the ghetto was to be liquidated, so they made a pact to run for their lives. And they jumped the fence and ran into the forest. But in the darkness, in the blackness, with all the confusion and the noise and the gunshots, they lost each other. And she never saw him again. More and more letters kept coming and they contained a bit about their present circumstances, a bit about their past, what they'd gone through, and especially what they're still going through. Jane, thinking about you for long months, I wrote letters to you in my mind, my health, my heart, circulation, eyesight, hearing, and depression prevented me from writing. Forgive me for this, don't be hurt. I keep all of your letters. I've never gotten such kind-hearted letters from anyone. You're like my little sister. The Nazis left me lonely and wounded. I was the youngest in the family. They were all brutally murdered. My mother, with all the old ones, was buried alive. I will never forget never forgive. 
They bombed my village. And on that first day of war, the 22nd of June, I lost my youth, my closest friends, my home. In your letter was a photo of all of you, my American friends. It became warm and joyful in my soul, though it's snowing outside and not very warm in my room. In your envelope, I found a check for $400. A great present from you, my American friends. Great thanks. I embrace all of you and kiss you. You become like my own family. I await your letters as a gift from destiny, your Yehuda. We weren't just sending money and then disappearing. We had become their family. We had become their friends. One woman wrote, she said, I have lived a long and very hard life. And I always thought that everyone lived this way. But you, you opened my eyes to the fact that somewhere people live completely differently and they are happy. But even now, I'm afraid to express my feelings and my thoughts because I've always lived in fear. You live in a land I can only dream of. Way over yonder is a place that I know where I can find shelter from the hunger and cold and the sweet taste in good life is so easily found this way
<laughs> more letters kept coming and more letters kept coming. And it struck me, though, that the money that we were sending was life-saving. But the connection, the connection to these people was equally life-saving. Someone wrote to us, if fields were sheets of paper and I possessed gallons of ink, I could never relate all that happened to us. We wrote back, they wrote back. Our connection to them deepened. We had all become a family, a family of strangers. I am Galina from Brest, Belarus. Thank you very much. I won't be able to repay you. The only thing I can do is pray for you. Relatives would not do what you are doing. You are helping complete strangers and with so many warm words as well. May God give you health and all his blessings. Your attention and help make it easier for me to bear my grief. My husband has been lying here already for the last 11 years from a stroke. He is 93. He cannot move and it is terrible for me. I am in a wheelchair and it's hard for me to get him up, to feed him, to wash him. I cry every night. I have high blood pressure and stenocardia. May God not let me die for what would happen to him. My nerves can hardly stand it. Your letters are for me like medicine. Every day and every hour I pray for you. May God protect you. During the war, I was a pilot and a mechanic of fighter planes. The plane was the Boston 26, and we received it from the United States on Lend-Lease. I was wounded fighting. I was only 22 years old, and I sent you some of my photos taken at this time. I was born October 25th, 1922. In the winter, when I was three months old, Mama was bathing me in a small tub. Suddenly, there was a pogrom happening. Horsemen came from Poland. Mama and the children hid between the stove and the kindling wood, and they put me in my tub under the bed. The bandits cut up the feather pillows with bayonets, searching for babies to kill. And Mama prayed that I would not cry. When they left, she found me sleeping peacefully in the water. So she got the rabbi to give me a second name, Chai, to live. And here I am, Chai Ginda, already 84 years old. I am infinitely indebted to you. For the rest of my life, I will never forget this. I embrace and I kiss you with my whole heart. What a pity that I cannot get about. I would give my life to see you. Your Ginda. These were the voices that resonated in my head as I went about my life in Los Angeles, now with one foot planted in comedy and the other foot planted firmly in the Holocaust. I am Fania Brankovskaya from Vilna. Dear Zana and all your company, I received a letter from you with such warm wishes. I survived the Holocaust in the Vilna ghetto. I was a member of an underground organization, then a fighter in the Avengers, a partisan detachment of teenagers, where we fought the enemy and tried to protect the honor of our people. But today is a very hard day on my heart. It's over 70 years since the Vilnius ghetto was liquidated. That was the day when I saw my relatives, parents, my sister, for the last time. I was only 17. I ran to the woods, to the partisans' detachment, not knowing that it was to be forever. But I am the only one left in my big family. Today, as every year on Remembrance Day, I went to the pits in Ponnery, the place where 100,000 people were killed, young, old, children. There are just a few of us left, just a few. We stood there by the pits and our hearts were torn into pieces, eyes full of tears. We sang the Jewish partisan song as we remembered our perished family members and those who survived and protected our people 
with weapons in their hands. I am proud to have been among them. We didn't just die. We protected the honor of our people. Someone asked if I could see my family again, what could I say? I would tell them, I fought for you. I am sorry for such a long and confused letter, but the last events have just stirred my memory. I am asked if it's not difficult for me to go off into Pottery to the killing fields. My answer is, those who lie there can't say anything. So this is my duty to tell their story. I hug you all. At my age, I have a right to do this. <laughs> Kisses, gratitude for your warmth and attention. Be happy, my dear American friends. When we go on our humanitarian trips to all of these places, we meet more and more people. We find more and more survivors who take us to places. It's places of their youth, places of thriving Jewish life, which will now just be living only in memory. Places that are crumbling and fading away. Graveyards that are sinking. Old wooden synagogues that are leaning and falling over. It'll all soon live only in memory. You know, many people always have asked me, why did these people stay? Why didn't they just leave after the war? You know, some was just too sick to leave, or they were caring for someone else that was too sick. Or some didn't know how to leave. They tried and tried, but they got trapped when the Iron Curtain fell. And some said, I will never leave. I will stay here, and I will tend the graves of my ancestors, the way my parents and grandparents did, and I will tell all who listen what happened here. They've killed everything and everyone that once was, and I will stay and tell about it. And these are the people who, when we go overseas, take us to the ghettos and the forests and the partisan bunkers. These are the people who stay to tell the world so that this tragedy, this terrible tragedy, will never happen again. And then there are people, most of them, who went to what was left of a town and met every train for years, hoping and hoping against hope that one person, one single person, would step off that train who they knew from before. One person, a relative, a friend, a son, a daughter, the boy next door. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. 
thousands and thousands of letters and thousands and thousands of stories came to us, which are now all part of our educational Holocaust archive, which we plan to make available to students and teachers worldwide. Now, the stories you heard tonight, these are the survivors' legacy to us and to future generations. They're speaking to us in their own words, sharing with us their history, sharing with us their incredible belief in kindness and compassion as the most important things in life. We can truly make a difference and give these people finally the dignity and the comfort and the care that they really deserve, that they finally deserve. You know, in 1939, the world turned its back on these people, but today, we can do something to help them. This is an incredible, incredible opportunity for us to actually do something about the Holocaust. So we can help the people who are going blind from untreated glaucoma because they cannot afford the $39 eye drops to save their eyesight. We can help the people who need life-saving medications like insulin and heart medications. These people are not just people. They are individuals who have endured the darkest days of human history. They have experienced the worst mankind has to offer. We want them now to experience the best, but we have to act now. From those original eight people I visited on my route trip back then, I am proud to say that today the Survivor Mitzvah Project is helping over 1,500 people in seven countries. <laughs> the elderly survivors we help, they have a name for everybody. They call us the Angels from America. How often do we get to be angels? How often do we get to dramatically change somebody's life? How often do we get to be the cavalry? You know, future generations will look back on this time and they will see that there were Holocaust survivors still suffering and they will look at us and we will say, yes, there were. But when we found out about it, we helped. These are the last generation of Holocaust survivors and we are the last generation who have the honor to be able to help them. So together, we are writing a more hopeful final chapter to the Holocaust, one of friendship, one of love, and one of kindness. I want to thank this incredible cast of actors and musicians and everyone who's participated in the Survivor Mitzvah Project. Thank you all so much.